please. That's our gift to you. Happy New Year. But here's the scripture for the whole year that I'm going to kick off today. Doesn't mean I'm going to teach it every Sunday. It just means this is our theme verse for the year. John 12, 32. From the English Standard Version. Let's see. Glasses up so I can read. That's a New Year's gift for me. Um, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Wow. I love this promise. This verse, I'm going to go into teaching mode here. You ready? That's why I wear a bow tie, because I'm a teacher. This verse explicitly points to the fact that Jesus would be lifted up on the old rugged cross. That is the actual context that before this is about anything about worship or anything about how we respond, our, our life of discipleship, anything about us. And in fact, this is about Jesus. And the reason I know that is because if you look at the next verse, what does the next verse say in verse 33? He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Well, there you go. Bible study is not that hard. Read the scripture, ask a question of it, and then it answers that question for you. Scripture interprets scripture. Be faithful. Be careful just asking yourself, what does this mean to me? Okay? Because you may come up with a really cool answer, but it may not be biblical. Okay? So, Jesus died on the, on the cross of Calvary so that all people would be drawn to him. Jesus' death on the cross is for all people. God does not want any to perish. The implications of this verse go beyond that, though. The implications of this verse go beyond Jesus' death. The implications of this verse are for every area of our lives. I mean, when you read the scriptures, I was studying Titus on my own the other day. Uh, it's a book in the New Testament. And Titus begins, Paul begins his letter to Titus saying how important it is that we teach people a right response to the gospel. And that's why this series is called, well, the, not that verse is why, but it is so important to me that in, in agreement with the Apostle Paul that we teach Christians, those who believe Jesus Christ was lifted up to draw all people, that we teach them a right response to this fact. Okay, so I am now going to teach you some of the implications for the fact that when Jesus is lifted up because of his death on the cross, all people will be drawn to him. Okay, that is not just an evangelistic truth, a truth that is good news, because evangelism is just the sharing of good news. That's, that, that's what that word means. Okay, it has implications for the church on how we are to respond not just in a once upon a time decision to accept Jesus, but an everyday decision on how we live in response to Jesus. Okay, that's called discipleship. That's called how we live our lives. Because Jesus has good news for you, but it came at a cost. It was his death. And then he invites us in the same way that he died on the cross to carry our cross. So we join him in his death. And so while I have the best news in the world for you, please know there's a cost. How we respond should be costly. Okay, so let's look at that. First, here it is. And Mike, thank you. You already covered this for me, but I'm going to repeat it because it's worth repeating. First, we lift up Jesus Christ by putting our faith in him. That's the first way we are to respond to Jesus Christ. And I would say it's the most important point of the sermon. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Born of the Virgin, Christmas morning. Do you believe that he is God's Son who took on flesh, lived a perfect sinless life so that through his death he would become the once and for all perfect Passover lamb so that there no longer needs to be another animal sacrificed. For those who put their faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and God then fills you with his presence, the Holy Spirit indwells you, comes in you, lives in you, 
and you join in a relationship with God forever through faith in Jesus Christ? Do you believe? That's why Jesus was lifted up on the cross, because if there's any other way for man to be saved, then the cross is foolishness. Do you believe in Jesus and who he says he is and why he had to die? Do you believe in the good news, the gospel, that this historic event that happened 2019 years ago, excuse me, that happened a little bit under 2,000 years ago because he was in his young 30s, do you believe that that historical event has implications upon your life today? That's the first question. That's the first point. And that will always be the first point. That will never stop being the first point. As long as you come to this church, the thing you will hear every time is the good news proclaimed of the historical life, death, and resurrection that has implications today. Have you responded to that good news? That's why he was born. That's why he died. That's why we gather. It's why we take communion. It's why we baptize people. It's why we live. It's good news. I want to read to you from John chapter 3. And in this passage, you're going to hear about the exaltation of Jesus, the lifting up of Jesus, connected. This is exactly connected to what Jesus promised. So hear me, please. John 3, I'm going to read to you verses 13 to 17. One of these verses you're going to know. Some of you will know all of them. One of them all of us know. Ready? John 3. No one has ascended into heaven. You know, you know what the word ascend means? To be lifted up. No one has been lifted up. Okay, so here we go. When I am lifted up, all people will be drawn to me. He said this to refer to the kind of death. But we got to remember, after his death, Jesus defeated death by being raised from the dead. Then he walked for 40 days in his resurrected body, where he taught his disciples about the kingdom of heaven. And then he ascended. He was lifted up. So this whole concept of when I am lifted up, has multiple, multiple theological, biblical uh, meanings. I have told you, this is Jesus talking, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. No one has been lifted up except for the one who first came down. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. No one has been lifted up to draw all humanity to him except for the one who has come down from heaven to do it. Verse, verse 14. Listen to this. This is connecting now to the book of Numbers, which I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to make you go there. Okay, I'm going to be nice, but write it down. Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. This is what Jesus is referencing. Jesus is, is referencing a real historical event. Okay, listen to this. So Moses was real. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must as, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Okay, everybody say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then here is a verse we all should memorize too. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Why did Jesus come? Not to condemn the world, but to save the world. How? By being lifted up. By being lifted up. And how was he lifted up? He was lifted up on the cross. That's why we wear crosses. That's why there's crosses in our houses. That's why there's crosses around our necks. Because it is the sign that will draw all people to it. It's the sign of Jonah. It, it, it's the sign that will save. Because it points to the God who saves. In the same way that Moses lifted up a serpent in Numbers 21 so that people could be healed from snake bites. Read the story. It's pretty cool. It's real. It's real. 
it's a real event in history. Jesus wouldn't refer to it as a real event if it wasn't a real event. Let, let Scripture interpret Scripture before you let your, your secular humanist worldview interpret Scripture. If Jesus refers to it as a real historical event, it's a real historical event. Because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Because he knows he wouldn't tell you a lie. He wouldn't have you misinterpret Scripture. Okay, it's a sub point. But in the same way that Moses lifted up a serpent because God told him to, and by the way, that's what doctors use now, that sign, what's it called? The what? What he said. That, that has become the symbol, like for the medical service corps in the army and, and places like that. The sign of the serpent wrapped around the staff. Because by that sign, people were healed. They, their lives were saved. In the same way that that sign represents healing in life, Jesus being lifted up on the cross not just represents healing in life, but is the way to your healing and your life. So what's our response to that? Now we start getting, now that we know the good news and we see this, it's not just a, a concept of the cross. It's connected to John 3, 16. It's connected to our, 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 our most heartfelt evangelical verse. How are we supposed to respond? And here's the first point. Well, actually the second point of the sermon, but the first point of how we respond. We believe, and here it is. We exalt. Okay? we exalt we lift up the name of jesus in our lives so when the when jesus is lifted up and all people are drawn to him we respond to that by putting our faith in the reality that he saves and then we exalt him we lift him up we worship him we put him as the most important thing person idea concept in our lives. Listen to Philippians. Turn with me if you have your Bibles. If you don't, or if you don't know how to get there, ask your neighbor or go to the table of contents. It's okay. In the new year, it's okay to use your table of contents. Please, don't let pride or hubris or sh any social pressure cause you not to learn how to use your Bible. Pull out your phone app. Maybe a New Year's resolution will be to memorize the 66 books of the Bible, 66 books of the Bible in order so you know how to find them. That, that might be a good goal for somebody. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. I want to read this to you because I want you to see that it was God's idea that we exalt Jesus. This is not the preacher's idea. This is God's idea. Here it is, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. <clears throat> Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself. Jesus, who is God, emptied himself. And when we respond to Jesus, and we're going to talk about this more next week, one of the things we do when we follow Jesus is we empty ourselves of our own ambition to take on his ambition, which is that all people will be drawn to him, that our lives in the workplace, our lives in our marriages, in our families, in the way we do things is to draw people to him. But we can't do that if we're full of ourselves. Following Jesus means carrying our cross, means being emptied of ourselves. It means having our pride and our ego crucified. It means death. And that is so hard for so many people. But that's next week's sermon. Please come back and please bring the person that came to mind who needs to learn how to do that, including yourself. Okay, back to the text. Being found in, the hu in human form, he humbled himself. And if you're thinking, I need to hear that, I'll be here next week too. Sorry. Um, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by, became, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, even death to the point of being lifted up, okay? Therefore, because Jesus was willing to die in a way that lifted him up, listen to this, what did God do? 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him. That's where I get the word. It means, but listen, it tells you what it means. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him, given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen? What does it mean that we exalt Jesus Christ? It means we call him Lord to the glory of the Father. If you have exalted Jesus Christ, which is the natural next step of putting your faith in him, okay? In fact, in Jesus' time, it wouldn't be two steps, it would be considered one. It, we, we parse these things because we, we just get into these nits of conversation. It never would have been a conversation. It would have just been one integrated whole. It would have been the spiritual outflow. It's kind of like baptism. Someone says, do I need to be baptized to be saved? I say, no, you don't need to do anything to be saved, but put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's all God's grace. And once you put your, your life in Jesus' hands and he fills you with the Holy Spirit and you want to obey what he commands you, and he commands you to get baptized. But you don't need to do it to be saved. You do it because you are saved. And if it's still a tension point, then go back to the beginning and make sure you're in a relationship with Jesus. And if you are in a relationship with Jesus, then what's the stumbling block? What is going on inside of you that's causing you not to want to obey him in this area? Does that make sense? Why are you getting in the way of the Spirit? Okay, that's why we need Jesus as Lord. Because our lives reflect him. And if there's something in our life we're not willing to submit to his lordship, the question is not whether we're saved, even though that's a relevant question for some people. The question is what's going on inside of me that's blocking the work work of grace in me to put his grace on display. Okay? You're saved by faith, not by works, so that no man should boast. Agreed? We're saved by faith alone, but as Martin Luther said, who's the champion of this, he said we're saved by faith alone, but faith never stands alone. The problem with most of the Reformed Church, which is all of us since the Reformation, all Protestantism, is that we like the first half of that and we forgot to say the second half. Saved by faith alone, but faith never stands alone. Okay, I'm back, I'm back. All right, as we hear in this scripture, scripture, Jesus is not only the Savior, he is the Lord. He is the Lord. And if he's not the Lord, he's not worth being your Savior. You've been duped by religion, by fancy preachers in their bow ties. Run for your lives! Seriously, if he's not Lord, get out now. Quick, run for your life. I'm a charlatan. Run. Tweet that out of context, please. (laughs) If I was running for office, you would have already. So the thing is, if Jesus is not Lord then he's not worth following. He's not worth giving up your Sundays for. Go to Westwood and go hiking. Do something worthwhile. But he is Lord. And if he's Lord, then he's worth then so much more than giving up a Sunday morning. He's worth giving your whole life to. Every ounce of your life. Everything. Everything. If he's not Lord, stop wasting your time. If he's been lifted up for his salvation then everything we have is his. Because apart from him, we have nothing and can do nothing. In 2020, I hope that becomes real to you. I hope in 2020, you feel this. Because I'm alive because of Jesus. I was dead in my sin. And now I'm alive in Christ. It's the only reason I'm happy. Because I've tried everything the world has to offer. Almost everything. And all of it falls short. All of it comes down with a crash on the other side. And that's before I wore, bo- wore bow ties, by the way. R- Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you will be let down. Not you will be miserable, stuck in religion. Not you will have to give up your Sundays for the rest of your life. Not you will lose 10% of your income automatically. None of that. 
You will be saved. You will be set free. You will live life abundantly. You will be set free from the bondage of your insecurities and your fears, your slavery to sin, whatever that sin may be for you. It's freedom. It's freedom, and all the worship we do, however you do it, is a sign of your freedom, that you've exalted him, and that his name is above all names. It's why we gather. It's why we take communion, to remember. Baptism is just a sign that he's bigger than your social issues. He's bigger than your fears. He's bigger than your theological conundrums that you were raised in this church, and they didn't believe that, and now you're here, and ah! He's bigger than all that. Stop, stop, stop. Just give your life to him, and he'll start, start, start. We get in the way so often. We get in the way. We get in the way. I get in the way. Amazing. Imagine what God could do if we just were in it for his glory. And none of us cared about getting any credit. Imagine if we weren't so concerned about being right, what he could do that was right. Oh man, we're so held back sometimes. We're all caught up in this religion thing. Jesus came to free people from the heavy burden of man's yoke. Take on Jesus' yoke, custom made for you, and you will find rest for your soul, freedom. And this is what it means that Jesus is Lord. This is what it means that Jesus is preeminent. And I want you to turn with me to Colossians, right after Philippians, literally right after Philippians. So if you're still there, go to Colossians chapter 1. And I want you to hear what it means. I'm going to use another fancy Bible word. It's called preeminent. Preeminent. It's a fancy Bible word, I know, but I wouldn't teach it to you unless it was in the Bible. And all it means is that he's first in everything. Doesn't mean he's the first thing in your to-do list, although he should be. It means he's in every aspect of your to-do list. He's through it all. He's the one who writes your to-do list, I hope. If, he's, if you're still writing your to-do list, you're still in bondage. That's a throwaway gift for you. I hope it haunts you all week long in a way that makes you question whether Jesus is Lord. Not because I want you to question your salvation. That's God's grace. But have you submitted? Have you bowed the knee? Have you fearfully come to him and said, you're more important than me. You're bigger than me. You're bigger than my fears. You're bigger than my social anxieties. You're bigger than my depression. And I do all these things to try to be in control because if I'm not in control, then I'm scared. Jesus, you're bigger than that. Sometimes you have to do things you don't like in order to become the person you desperately want to be. And that is a big part of discipleship. I'll unpack that for you more next week. Please come back. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. And invite some friends, would you? We got plenty of parking out there. He is the image. Listen to what it means that Jesus is preeminent. Listen to what it means that he's Lord of your life. Listen to what it means from God's point of view. Jesus is the image of, this is Colossians 1, 15. He is, Jesus is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by Jesus all things were created. Did you hear that? All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together, and Jesus is the head of the, bo of the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Jesus, to reconcile to God all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross, because he was lifted up, because he shed his blood. This is who Jesus is. He is the King of the kings. He is the Lord of the lords. And if you want a trip... Go to the book of Revelation and look up Revelation 17, 14 and Revelation 19, 16 and feel the fullness of the sovereignty of God of what it means that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings. If you want to fear the Lord and tremble to know what it means to follow the God who is all grace, don't do it now because you won't be with me. Do it later. Write it down. I see some of you going to Revelation. Stop it. Write it down. Stay with me. Is Jesus your Lord? Is he your Lord? And 
There's only one way to know. There's only one way for you to know that he is your Lord. That he will have gathered you to himself. He will have brought you to himself. He will have connected you to himself. He will have made you a part of who he is. Not in substance, that would be heresy, of course. But in relationship. He's brought you to himself. He's gathered you to himself. And that's Jesus' promise of John 12, 32. That when I am lifted up, all people will be drawn to me, gathered to me. That's what the church is supposed to represent, church. We are not a country club. We are not, as, as much as we support each other and try to, but we fall on our face sometimes trying. We're not any of those things. Before we're anything else, we are a prophetic sign to the world of what happens when Jesus is lifted up. We're gathered to him. We're brought to him. And guess what we do as the members of the body of Christ when we're drawn to him, we're gathered to him? We're supposed to listen to his words. We're supposed to, we're gathered to him to listen closely. Jesus is Lord, are you listening? And are you listening closely? When you respond to the crucified Savior lifted up on the cross, I want you to hear this. This, is, this needs to be said. When you respond to the crucified Savior lifted up upon the cross, you are simultaneously called to submit to the exalted King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the work of grace in you. It's to free you. It's to deliver you from the sin that has warped and perverted your thinking, that has warped and perverted your heart and its desires. For the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? God rescues you from what you think you know and what you think you feel is right. But the problem with the church and why it's so miserable and so impotent is because we want to bow the knee. We want the crucified Lord to be our Savior, but we don't want to bow the knee to his exalted lordship of our lives because we think we know something and that we've got it all figured out. And it tears us apart. It rips... Sorry about that, honey. She's grabbing her ears like, yeah, I know that was loud, sorry. It, it, it can rip us apart. It can tear us to shreds. Counselors call it cognitive dissonance. So if you're into counseling, psychotherapy, anything like that, they call it cognitive dissonance. It means... You want to think, you want to live one way, but you think another. So you're constantly torn. It's like someone who hates conflict that does conflict resolution for a living. Ah! Someone who hates people that uh, works with people. Jesus wants you to be a whole person, an integrated person. And the way you become healthy and whole and spiritually vital and emotionally healthy and all these things is honestly not through the self-help industry. It's by bowing the knee to Jesus. It's by letting the grace of God work its way in every aspect of your life. He is exalted. He is preeminent. Live that way, and you'll have the abundant life. You'll have eternal life now. It's grace. I want to read to you Philippians. Another wonderful verse. I think I'm coming close. Getting there. Coming close. Stay with me. Excuse me. Ephesians. Sorry about for those of you who turn to Philippians. Go to the book before that. Ephesians. I want you to hear. I need to. I, I feel like the Spirit is telling me I need to impress upon you that this is grace. Because I know whenever I talk about lordship, old debates come up. And I know a lot of you have been a part of those debates. So I really feel like it's important, whether you've been a part of the old debates or you have nothing to do with that and you're just new to this and it's fresh and it's exciting and it's wonderful, I, I you need you to hear, regardless of whether I'm trying to undo past hurts or I'm trying to help you get a good start in the Christian life, the Word of God can do that, okay? So F Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Whether you're old or young, new at this or experienced at this, you need to hear this word that everything I'm talking about Jesus as your Savior and Jesus as your Lord is grace. It's not works. Here it is. But God, 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him. Oh, did you hear that? Maybe this is something new to you because I'm pointing out this whole concept of being lifted up and being raised. Listen to the promise of God in your relationship with Jesus. Verse 6. And raised us up with him. And he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, right now. That's like, what? What? No, I'm still right here, Jesus. What do you mean I'm up there raised up with you? That's grace. Right now, the way God sees you is exalted with Jesus. Sinless, perfectly obedient. He sees you that way. That's your positional, that's your positional holiness with him. That's the way he sees you. Though we know on earth here, we still are in process of becoming that which he already made us. So that even the journey is one of grace. It's one that he has already insured for us. Oh, okay, it's verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches. That means they can't be measured. The riches that cannot be measured. The immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. That's what grace means. It's all gift. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works. There it is. Flowing out of his grace in your life is good works that he will do through you because, here it says, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So how do you give glory to God now that you're saved, now that you've exalted him? You give glory to God by now living out the natural consequences of his grace within you which is the holy spirit doing what god gave you to do you're free you don't have to do anything to please god you're already lifted up in his presence you don't have to fear man you don't have to fear what other people think about you you don't have to fear whether god will be disappointed in you or not isn't that crazy because there's nothing, if we believe grace is what grace is, then there's nothing you can do to cause God to love you more, and there's nothing you can do to cause God to love you less. And I don't have to preach another sermon in my life to know that God loves me. I don't have to show up at anyone's house or anyone's funeral to know that God loves me. I'm perfectly loved by a perfect God. And if I'm free of my fear of man, then when I do show up at your house, or I do show up at a funeral, or I do preach, it's out of the overflow of grace not out of an insecurity or fear of whether I'll be accepted by you or loved by you. It's freedom from the fear of man. It's freedom because I put my fear in the Lord. And then he took that fear and rescued me and delivered me. You can be set free from all the anxiety and all the worry that this life has to offer you. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be like that. It's a process. It's a disciplining of the mind. It's a journey of believing that Jesus will lift you up with him if you put your faith in him and then you can live in that freedom today because imagine your life without fear imagine how much energy you would have if you weren't wasting your time wondering if you're good enough to go to heaven because the dirty nasty truth is you're not and no one is but that's why Jesus came and if any of us were good enough to go to heaven, then he wouldn't need to have come. But he came so that we can know that that is done and now in him live by grace. When you can submit yourself to the lordship of Christ, you're free. You're free. He gathers you for your freedom. He connects you to his body for your freedom, for your deliverance. And that will change your mind, and that will change your heart, and that will change your life. Colossians 3. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. I was asking the Lord what he wanted me to do. 
because I have so much I want to give you, but I got all year, and I don't want to hammer you all today, right? So come back. If this is the only sermon you're going to hear all year, I'm sorry. I wish you could hear the rest of it because there's so much more, and it's going to take all year to unpack these truths. Because the implications of the fact that Jesus has been lifted up are great. They're profound. They, they're, they, they affect every aspect of our beings. Every aspect of our thought life. So I just want to end with this today. And then we'll keep going. Colossians 3. If then you have been raised up with Christ. Okay, do you get that? It's a different book but it's referencing the fact that we've been raised up with christ isn't that cool how scripture interprets its scripture i'm not making this stuff up i will never give you anything but what is from the word i couldn't make up this stuff it's beyond me if then you have been raised with christ seek the things that are above where christ is seated at the right hand of god it's where he's interceding for you right now. It's where he's praying for you. And he's going to return and make all things right. Set, verse 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, come Lord Jesus, then you also will appear with him in glory. And between now and that day, you can glorify God by doing what God has called you to do. He is your Lord. He's gathering his children, his people to himself. He wants them to listen closely because he has a word for each of us, for our freedom, for our good. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to die to self? Jesus, as we respond to this message this morning, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would first just acknowledge that we need you, Lord God. Lord, this is the first, maybe for some of us, the first big decision we're going to make in 2020. Maybe some people have already made some. But Lord, bigger than any New Year's resolution, Lord, right now, may the Holy Spirit move in each person within the sound of my voice to make a decision for Jesus. Jesus has been. It's done. He has been exalted by God because he was lifted up on the cross of Calvary. He was lifted up and ascended to the right hand of the Father and he is returning. Because Jesus has done this, he promises that all people will be drawn to him. And right now, Lord, my prayer is that every person with the sound of my voice will respond today today is the salvation to be drawn to jesus to bow the knee lord if there's someone with the sound of my voice that has not yet bowed the knee has not yet said jesus be my lord be my savior that they would do it and Lord, if there's someone here who has a situation in their life, has something going on, Lord, where they are miserable or they are hurting or they are caught up in sin or addiction, and Lord, there's something else being the Lord of their life, being the authority of their life. If there's some other name that is more important to them than the name of Jesus, including their own name, their own reputation, I pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would come hard on them right now, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, and invite us to see our great need for you and to respond. Amen. Amen.